Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Pat, how are you doing? I'm doing great today, Peter. You doing okay? Good, thanks. Who have we got on the show today? Today we've got Dr. Ashley Boyle from uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, she's going to be with us to talk about strangles. Yeah, strangles is a big problem. Um, it's highly infectious, um, and it's just really the bane of people's lives. You get a strangles outbreak in a barn of horses, it's not a good day for America. No, it's it's a bad thing uh, for horse owners, veterinarians. We, we all really dislike seeing it. So anything we can do to help people to get past uh, one of those outbreaks or to avoid one would be beneficial. Yeah, and the good thing about Ashley is, you know, she's in field service at uh, New Bolton Center. That's a large animal hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, so she's... Uh, you know, dealt with strangles outbreaks. It's good to have somebody with a bit of practical knowledge, but somebody has done some research as well to just try to break it down and sort of say, you know, this is what it is, this is how we deal with it, and this is where we're going. Yeah, very smart person, very well versed. Looking forward to hearing what she has to yeah, say. Yeah, should be a good conversation. So, uh, coming up next, Dr. Ashley Boyle from the University of Pennsylvania Field Service Section at New Bolton Center, Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Welcome to Stallside. Ashley, welcome to Stallside. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I'm currently an associate professor at at University of Pennsylvania, New Bolton Center, um, and I work in the field service section. So I'm out in the field every day that I'm on clinics, and uh, um, I went to vet school at Cornell and did my internship at Littleton Large Animal Clinic in Colorado, um, and then did a medicine residency at UC Davis. Um, And then I have been at Penn since then. Okay, good. And so what drew you to the University of Pennsylvania? Well, partly life, because my husband was already in Philadelphia. (laughs) So we were across the country from each other while I was in my residency. So, so life brought me to the University of Pennsylvania. um, And, um, and the, the right job came around. So yeah, it was a it was a great place to work. It's a long time since I've been there, but it's a it was a great place to work. It's a great bunch of people, and it is a really good part of the world to live in. It's a beautiful part of the world. Yeah, it it's really beautiful. is. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, we've got you here today to talk about something which is uh, a disease which strikes fear into the heart of most horse owners, and definitely a number of veterinarians when they come up against it. Strangles. So um, talk about uh, strangles to us. Where are we going? Where have we been? And uh, what are we going to do about it? Okay. Well, it's, I like to say that it's um, like strep throat of horses, basically, because um, here I'll show an, a picture. It's a very old disease. It was actually first um, described back in um, 1251. And I like to say that it's like um, strep throat of, of horses because it has a lot of similarities to to strepiogenes in humans, as you can see in these pictures of some nasty human throats. So I think we, all of us veterinarians would actually rather um, look at horse throats than we would like to look at, at human throats. Um, but it's caused by a, a gram positive cocci and um, that bacteria attaches to the, the tonsils in the horse and clinical signs can develop in three to 14 days after exposure. And it's transmitted by inhalation or by direct contact. The shedding can happen. What's very interesting. It can happen um, 48 hours after the onset of the fever. So that could actually be very helpful when we're managing the outbreaks because we can actually, if you separate the horses really early on, you can actually help control your outbreak. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. I have a nice chart for going through an outbreak. Um, But these horses can persist in shedding for two to three weeks or maybe even six weeks. And in the horses that can become carriers, it can be in their guttal pouches, which is an outpouching of the eustachian tube um, or the auditory tube in the horse. Um, and it can s- stick around for years, potentially. The clinical signs can be um, 
a high fever, like 103 degrees Fahrenheit. And these horses will often be lethargic and depressed. Um, they can have nasal discharge from both nostrils or one nostril. Um, they will often have um, large submandibular lymph nodes and um, retropharyngeal lymph nodes. These lymph nodes are around the throat. Um, I have a picture here that, of a foal that has a massive um, swelling in his retropharyngeal area. So when you talk about the, the, the clinical signs, is there a place that can, how hard is it to differentiate a strangles abscess from say a strep zoo abscess? Cause I think, cause we get a lot of those around here where you just get this regular old strep zoo and it's, it's not a big deal, but clinical signs are they, they seem to present almost the same. Yeah. I mean, I, I think getting an, getting an aspirate of those, those lymph nodes can be helpful to make sure you're not dealing with strep equi when you're dealing with a strep zoo epidemicus, um, abscess. Um, I, I find that they actually seem to have more edema around them when they are strep equi. Um, okay. They, and they seem to be more painful, um, in, in my experience. Okay. That sounds good. Peter, anything to add to that? It seems like, you know, um, we, we don't get, sometimes you get a fever with them. Sometimes you yeah, don't. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And the scary ones yeah. are they can look clinically indistinguishable from, yeah. from strangles and it's, yeah, it's a bit of a frightening time. So it's good that, you know, there are subtle differences you can pick up on. Yeah. And what's challenging sometimes is that there, there's even been some, um, reports of strep zoobidemicus actually being more contagious. Um, I mean, there's one paper out there from Sweden. They, they actually did have an outbreak of strep zoo being contagious. So, um, I think it depends on what strain you're dealing with, but I think the, the classic strep zoo is, is not contagious. And, um, but there have been some reports of, of, you know, some weird variants. Thank you. Another thing that's can be interesting is that it can um, also present in weird places. So um, I have a picture here of a horse that actually um, has ocular discharge and that culture positive for step equi. So it can, it can present in weird places as well as like below the base of the ear, um, in the front of the shoulder, cause there are lymph nodes in those areas as well. And then you can have the horse that actually is having trouble breathing. So they're, they've got head and neck extension. Um, they're having trouble swallowing. Um, and those are the more, um, severely affected animals. And then you can also have the horse that actually almost looks normal. Um, th this ho I have a horse here on the left that um, only has a little bit of nasal discharge. Um, he actually did have a fever um, and was positive for strep equi, but then you can have your carriers that are acting totally normal and they um, might actually have strep equi in their guttural pouches. So ways to determine whether you are dealing with strep equi would be the traditional way before was, you know, using a bacterial culture, but we've also gone to um, uh, preliminary chain reactions, so molecular techniques, and um, it's definitely faster, um, especially if you have a, a lab that can um, do it nearby, and it's also three times more sensitive than the than a culture, but you want to use the um, samples that you have in front of you. So, so if you have um, a horse with an abs abscess in front of a, in front of you, you want to actually get an aspirate of that abscess because um, that'll be your definitive diagnosis. It's a gold mine for for your for your strep diagnosis. Um, but if they don't have abscesses that are visible, then you can potentially use a nasal pharyngeal wash. Um, which is a, a throat wash, or you can also use a guttural pouch wash. But it also depends on the stage of the disease that the animal is in. So, so the horse that is just beginning to have clinical signs is not necessarily going to be positive in their guttural pouch yet, especially if you're in that first 48 hours of, of symptoms because they're not shedding yet. So 
that's where you might actually have to take more than one sample to um, find your positive sample, especially if you're catching the horse early in the fever. So we no longer think of the culture as being the gold standard um, because it can miss up to 40% of positives. So it's important to actually get multiple samples um, and to increase your sensitivity of getting a positive, um, to to find your positive horse. Because even though you don't want the horse to be positive, you actually need to know whether it's positive so that you can, you know, isolate and, and get your outbreak under control. No, I think that's a good point because I think a lot of times we, we don't want it to be positive so yeah. bad. The worst mistake you can make is uh, close your eyes and bury your head in the sand. And so you, so you yeah. need accurate information for yeah. sure. Yeah. And the, the, the information you had there about doing repeated samples is being much more sensitive too, because you get a lot of pushback sometimes from clients. Uh, you know, why can't I just get one negative and go to my show? And this as well, you know, it's, you need more than one negative to actually be negative because it's just such a difficult disease to diagnose sometimes. I mean, I've had cases come through the clinic here that have been tested multiple times and they were negative and um, you suddenly pop it up. And people sort of say, well, how, how can this be when I've had all these negatives? And it says, well, you just don't always get it, no matter how good the testing is. Yeah. And there, um, a group in Sweden actually looked at that. They um, looked at more than one sample being more sensitive. They also showed that the nasal pharyngeal wash was better than doing a nasal pharyngeal swab. Um, we also looked at um, looking at carrier horses. So these were horses or looking at convalescent horses, the so horses that were recovering. And we were trying to look for the car- horses that became carriers or trying to find them. And we, we compared, um, an, a flock swab. So this was like a special kind of swab that had extra, um, uh, should pick up more a sample um, of, the, and we did that of the throat, and then we did a nasal pharyngeal wash, and then we went into the guttural pouch, and we found that it was fifty times more likely that the horses were um, going to be positive, or, or we would find a positive in the guttural pouch. So, um, in our study, we didn't actually have any horses that were. Um, uh, positive in the nasal pharynx and not in the guttural pouch. Anyone that was positive in the nasal pharynx was also positive in the guttural pouch, or they were they were positive in just the guttural pouch. Um, the group in Sweden have, have found some horses that were um, just positive in the nasal pharynx. So it's probably good to actually get a kind of combined guttural pouch nasal pharynx sample where you kind of catch it from the nose um, to to look for those carriers, but it was definitely, um, much more sensitive to that 50 times more sensitive to find it when, when we found it in the guttural pouch. What, how, how sensitive is just looking in the guttural pouch? Were you able to visualize something in there on most of those cases, or do you still need to do the wash with it? I think you still need to do your, I feel very confident that you still need to do the wash because I think there are some horses that actually um, don't have a lot of disease in their guttural pouch, especially if they're, you're trying to clean up an outbreak and they're, um, they'll have, um, they might have a little bit of fluid or, or they might look normal, um, but you still end up with a positive and, and probably more often than not, those horses might actually be positive on PCR and negative on culture. Um, But I still consider those horses positive on PCR or positive and potentially infectious. We don't know whether they're definitely infectious, but, but um, you know, two groups have actually looked at horses where they followed the horses out um, uh, a ways. And they, some of these PCR positive culture negative horses were then positive eight, eight months later. Um, so they were, you know, definitely playing a role in the infective nature. And then there was also been a, um, a research group that they did just 
three knees, three guttle pouch cultures. And then they put, they put all these ne- horses that were supposedly negative back into the out into their research herd. And they ended up with, they were able to show molecularly that these, it was the same outbreak that they caused um, so there probably was a horse that was PCR positive in that group, but they all were culture negative. So, um, I think it's important to actually do those washes, even if it looks okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think that's really sobering that the guttural pouch is so many more times likely to have the organism in if they're infected than any other place, because there's always a bit of resistance to say, well, you know, why do you want to put the scope in there? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do that? And it's just that, well, if you don't look, you don't find, you know? Yeah, 50 times is a big number. That's huge. That really is important to know. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to remember that that isn't necessarily the horse that is first starting their, their, um, their disease so this these were horses that were you know you're trying to clean up so so um i i think it, we have to be careful not to just say that a horse that's negative on guttle pouch wash but they were just exposed that that you know you have to give them time obviously to incubate and and potentially come down with it for, first before you're actually going to find it so it really does d- depend on the stage of the disease to determine kind of what what um area you want to be sampling yeah and when i'm in that situation I was tell people the key to doing this is to detect and eliminate um, the infection in the asymptomatic carrier because that's the one you're looking for, right? Yeah. Because as you say, they've gone yeah. through the disease, it's sitting there, you can't see it and they're just shedding it from time to time and it's just keeping the fire going through the herd and people get pretty frustrated when the number of times you have to come back to get it under control, but until you do, it's just going to keep popping out. Yep, yep. You know, it was, it was always, you know, because I've dealt with a few outbreaks and Gosh, I, I don't know how long it's been since we've identified these these carriers, but the the word was it's 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 endemic to the farm. Everybody thought it was you know mm-hmm. it was on the farm. You can't have that farm. It's a strangles farm. No, it was a strangles mare. Yes, yeah. that was spreading it around. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, and the introduction of an animal onto the farm. You know that's always the worry for uh, um, farms around here is introducing an animal onto the farm and away it goes. And you know finding that it, it'll take you months to get oh, yeah. that under control. No matter what you do, it just takes months to get it under control. Yeah. And some, you know, some barns have gone to where they actually do washes on horses as they come in. Um, to be, I mean, I don't, I don't have any barns myself that are doing that because it's obviously very labor intensive and, and, um, you know, has an expense associated with it, but people who have been kind of burned by the disease, um, you know, one way to kind of keep it out of, of the farm is to, you know, to, as they come in but at the same time you also have to know their history to make sure they weren't you know exposed recently and it may still be in their incubation period so no that's that's good and i have had a few farms that did that and you're right it does get expensive fast because you know you you need to do two samples uh, you know what we did them 10 days apart, two weeks apart, something yeah. like that. Yeah. But then you have to have them quarantined clear up until the time that you get that second negative because it doesn't do you any good to, you know, yep. t- to take the test, turn them out and then find out they're yeah, positive. They now they're now positive. the whole herd's exposed and you've, yeah. you've totally yeah. defeated the purpose of the, of the surveillance program. So it does get expensive and it's hard, but, um, it's cheaper than an outbreak. Absolutely. It's a lot cheaper yeah. than absolutely. But, but, you know, as, as we know, they can still slip by you. Oh yeah. But it's uh, but but you definitely um, help yourself out, so it's an option. Yep, and I, I like to say that you know a horse is negative of being a, a or free of being a carrier if they've had they have no you know no evidence of disease in their guttural pouch, so their guttural pouch looks healthy as well as being negative on the nasal pharyngeal wash or uh, on the guttural pouch wash because. Um, you know, there are times when you're looking at a, a guttural pouch and it doesn't look healthy or there might be, you know, evidence of stuff still on the floor kind of erupting into the guttural pouch. And 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 if it's coming back negative on the PCR, then I would be suspicious that, OK, it just hasn't started 
erupting into the guttural pouch yet because, um, you know, you want that guttural pouch to look healthy in addition to being negative. So I think it's really important to actually scope them, not do a blind guttural pouch wash because you may miss some that have some abnormalities. So Ashley, that was really interesting on diagnosis and how you have to be so thorough and so persistent. What about treatment? So treatment should be for the for the animal's welfare. So we really um, discourage the use of antibiotics as a preventative um, because one, it's going to give you a false sense of protection, and um, it might lead to resistance. And we don't have you know penicillin resistance yet, but um, it. It's important that um, when treatment is used, that it's that the appropriate dose and frequency is used. And I find that these horses often need to be on antibiotics for an extended period of time. Um, scenarios where you can use antibiotics would be potentially if you had no lymphinopathy and you had the fever. Um, but if you have the lymphinopathy already, then you're probably going to actually just prolong the fact that these lymph nodes need to erupt and, and, um, drain. So if you start the antibiotics too early, then, so I like to have them, um, drain properly. And then, you know, if they're not doing, you know, if they're not eating well, or they're having persistent fevers, um, I try to lance those abscesses and then start them on antibiotics so that they can start feeling better. Um, and then you obviously have, you know, complication scenarios where you have either like bastard strangles or otherwise known as metastatic strangles, where you might have um, um, abscesses somewhere else in the body. And those horses often need like two months of an of antibiotics. That's usually the mean amount of time that those those horses need antibiotics. Um, and or horses that have um, purpura hemorrhagica, so they get an autoimmune response, um, a, a hyper autoimmune response to the disease, or um, and often they need antibiotics and steroids at the same time to calm that immune system down. Um, and then local treatment of the guttural pouches. So um, if, if you find that you have a horse that is having, you know, persistent empyema or pus within the guttural pouch and, um, you know, lavaging that, that guttural pouch and getting it, um, cleared physically with getting all of that material out, which can obviously be painstaking sometimes, um, and then treating them locally with antibiotics within the guttural pouch. Yeah. Interesting uh, point that you talked about metastatic strangles. Uh, what sort of animal would be likely to fall prey to that because usually we think of strangles is just in the upper respiratory tract and some draining lymph nodes. Which cases have you seen that where it's spread throughout the animal and, and caused issues in other places? Well, I think it can happen potentially, potentially happen in, in any horse, but it might be the horse that is more immunocompromised in some, in some respect. Um, I mean, there was, was a theory at one point that horses that were treated with antibiotics too early, that maybe that would actually make them predisposed to, to um, faster strangles, but there's actually been no evidence to actually prove that. Um, so I don't think that that's the case. Um, you know, there really is no scientific evidence out there that says that that, that is a cause. Um, I mean, I, I think that the horses that, um, come down the, with this, the upper respiratory disease in a, in a, um, significantly that maybe have a higher chance of developing faster strangles down the road. Um, and those horses would present, you know, with a, you know, insidious, um, fever, um, you know, so intermittent fever and they, you know, are not, you know, they're maybe not doing as well. They're, they're, um, having some ill thrift that's happening. Yeah. I've sort of seen, I don't know about you, Bart, but I've seen it in some foals. When you get sort of young foals, when the when the mare or an in contact in a horse has strangles, and then all of a sudden you've got abdominal abscesses yep. in these foals, and actually there was yep. one strangles outbreak on a farmer. Remember, I was going out there ultrasounding the abdomen of the mare, and there was this 
huge abscess in her abdomen. And um, I just wouldn't have expected that in an adult mature broodmare. But um, the foals on that farm, they were popping up abscesses all over the place in lots oh, of places. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the foals, is the, that's the hard thing yeah, to deal yeah. with. And, you, and especially you watch these newborn foals and that, that mare's licking them off and dripping pus yeah, on dripping them at the same time. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, those, are, those are hard to swallow. Yeah, I've had some. Uh, good joke there. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> I've had, had some had to like trach these. They had to do trachs on these foals because the lymphadenopathy was so severe. Yeah. And that they just had to have trachs in, and you think, wow, this is you know, the worst strep throat ever. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you got some pretty impressive pictures there of those chondroids. Yeah, you, I um, I'm not going to be able to eat lima beans again. That was. <laughs> Jeez, Bart, you always have to make a food analogy, don't you? <laughs> no, it wasn't hard. That looked like a soup in there. That's uh. Yeah, just don't invite me to dinner at your yeah. house. Not that you ever have or ever will. <laughs> We're getting further away, but yeah, you never, further, know. never know. Never know. So okay, yeah. So it looks like you've got some physical removal of uh, on for those who are on the YouTube. You can actually see a nice little video of um, removal of uh, chondroids here. So talk to the audience about that. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned before, this can be rather painstaking. I, I, sometimes it can actually take a while to or multiple visits to get the the. Um, empyema or the pus out of the guttural pouch. And, and sometimes they'll actually have these, um, uh, you know, dried out pus rocks, otherwise known as chondroids, um, that can stick around in the guttural pouch a long time. And so there's um, equipment that can be used through the scope um, that um, using a basket to get the the um, pus out or to get the chondroids out. Sometimes I just use the the basket to actually just pull the to kind of get it going so that it'll start coming out. Um, you know, you can you can infuse um, other products that kind of break up the pus um, that break up the bind the bonds within the pus um, and that'll also help um, break it up so that it's easier to remove. But it, it's lavage is one of the key things to, to um, removing this material from the guttural pouch. I mean, there's also surgical options if you're having trouble, you know, if sometimes if they're being, um, you know, refractory to treatment um, and you can, do um, you know your veterinarian can do surgery where they often in the hospital set well usually in the hospital setting um, where you actually either make a bigger opening to the guttural pouch or um, you know make an opening under the throat but but I, I find that you can actually you know hopefully you can usually get it out with the with the the scope it's just just takes a while it's, it's like the weirdest video game ever yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that's a point probably to emphasize too is it takes a long time. I mean, physically removing these, we get them, we just take days and days, and sometimes you don't make as much progress as you think because yeah. it's a, it's a really tough thing to deal with. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> why don't we do, why don't I talk about how I um, manage an outbreak and kind of separating horses and so forth. Okay. It looks like you have a traffic light motif going here. Yeah. Um, so it can be very helpful to actually group these animals and into, you know, a, the infected animals. So you can make them the red group and then the amber group would be the exposed and the con the exposed horses or the horses that were in contact with the infected horses, but that are not sick at this time. And then you have your green group though. I find that very often not sometimes you think you have a green group and they're actually all Amber <laughs> because they've, you know, there's been a lot of exposure on the bar on the farm. So, um, and you know, I'm well aware of the fact that it's, it's actually, it's not necessarily as simple as this diagram uh, because you actually have to make sure that animals can get along or that you're actually, you know, have the pl the place to put these animals. But uh, I mean, I've done things where, you know, you actually kind of make, make quarantine areas out of, you know, areas that weren't necessarily stalls before. Um, if you don't have enough 
uh, places to put these horses because one of the key things, as I mentioned before, is is um, moving those horses that have fevers. Um, so this is a I have a schematic up here where you know you start with um, horses with clinical signs and you're going to then try to isolate that those horses that are dirty or red in that red area and the move the in contacts to an in contact area. And then you're going to be monitoring those temperatures. And that, that is key to actually helping contain this outbreak. Because if you monitor the temperatures, ideally twice a day, which I know is labor intensive, but you can actually especially if you record the temperatures and you know whether there's actually a bump in your in your temperature, then you actually can move that horse into the proper area and, and then um, before they actually start shedding. Um, and then you're going to go through your treatment and your supportive care, um, and then you can move them to an untested area um, and start testing them about two to three weeks after there's been no clinical signs. But one caveat is that if they have clinical signs for longer than two weeks, I would highly recommend, you know, going in and looking at those guttal pouches because sometimes those are the horses that have, you know, significant guttal pouch empyema or pus in their guttal pouches because they um, are are going to end up being the bane of your existence and, and um not clear up, not clear up. And if you don't start lavaging them, you're, you're not going to be able to get them cleared, you know, sooner rather than later. So, and then doing your guttle pouch lavage, looking at whether you have a positive PCR or, um, or not, and then treating those animals with lavage, maybe putting, sometimes putting indwelling catheters into those, those guttal pouches so that lavages can be done frequently. And, um, and then once they're negative, moving them to, into a negative area um, so that you can <clears throat> release them from quarantine after you've done your multiple tests um, on, on the guttle pouch. I mean, I find that if you actually have a, um, a, a horse that's a guttle pouch, their guttle pouch is clean and their PCR is negative, um, then you may not need to do, um, you know, multiple, I mean, you, you do want to have probably more than one, but it's, um, it's, a uh, visualizing and having that negative guttural pouch on the lavage is really helpful. Yeah. This is looking pretty labor intensive and, you know, sort of segregating the horses into the groups and not having personnel transfer between those groups, this is not yeah. an easy thing to take care of. Yeah. And, and transmission can happen so easily. It's, uh, you, you know, it can, it can be a matter of dipping a hose in one water bucket and then, yeah. and then another. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think that's what people don't realize is that, you know, you mentioned direct contact before, but there's indirect contact as well. As like, as you just mentioned, like water sources, well, where do all the horses congregate in a paddock? Yeah, at the water point. source or at a feed source, and then you know what's the, what's the worst thing in an animal disease outbreak is these things, right? Is your hands because people just transfer stuff from horse to horse. They don't think about it. Cleaning stalls, feeding equipment, just touching horses, and this is just so highly contagious. How long does this organism last in the environment? Well, we talked about it spreading from horse to horse, which implies you know direct or indirect contact. But how long is this organism going to hang around? after you've actually had an infectious horse in a stall or in some sort of situation, how long do people have to worry? Yeah, it's, there's, there's a couple of different studies that have looked at that. There's, um, you know, in the laboratory setting, it said, you know, it said that it could actually stick around for like 60 days. Um, S Scott Weiss's group in Canada, they actually looked at pus on the fence line and they couldn't actually um, culture it after three days. Um, um, so that, you know, that was, um, you know, good news, but, um, and then, um, Andy Durham's group in, in, um, the UK, they actually looked at a lot of different things 
um, you know, depending on the ambient temperature outside. So how warm or cold it was outside and, and whether the substance was like wet and they were actually able to find it in a, like a, nas a wet nasogastric tube 35 days after it was inoculated. So, um, I mean, these are obviously, um, you know, experimental settings, but trying to make them more realistic experimental settings. Um, so, you know, the, the good thing about strep equi is that it doesn't like dry environments. So if you can dry out where, what you're cleaning, it's, you know, it's so important to clean to, you know, do your two steps of cleaning and then disinfecting. So, you know, your two part cleaning and then drying. Um, but that's where the, you know, water buckets become such a problem is that it's, you know, they're wet all the time. So, so, um, you know, drying out the, the environment. And also I think, you know, I think that resting a paddock for a couple of weeks is probably sufficient, especially if it's, you know, warm out and there's sunshine on it. Um, but, you know, I think it's a little, you know, when you're dealing with a barn, you need to make sure you do like a two-step process of cleaning and then make sure everything is dry. So um, you've got through the outbreak. Um, people would like to not have that in the first place. So what about preventatives? Um, there's some vaccines on the market. Talk to us about those. Yeah. So there's um, there's a strep vax, which is an um, intramuscular vaccine. And then there's um, Pinnacle, which is the intranasal modified live vaccine. Um, the, the Pinnacle vaccine, you know, is going to actually provide some mucosal protection as well as, um, uh, you know, well, it's, it's going to provide your mucosal protection. Um, but there are definitely some things that you have to be careful about when you're, when you're using that. So, you know, you should try not to do any other procedures when the animal's getting the strangles vaccine, because it is modified live. Um, you need to handle it and wear, wear gloves when you're handling it. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to by accident, put it into the muscle because you'll end up with an abscess within the muscle. I have seen those. I've <laughs> seen that happen too. Yeah. yeah. People thought it was an IM vaccine and yeah. They form it, nice, it gets a nice abscess. Yeah, it gets a very nice abscess. Nice it strangles abscess. They're fun yeah. to drain. Very fun to drain. Yes. <laughs> so you want to avoid those. Um, and oh, we've done some work where looking at like, when is it safe to vaccinate? And SEM titer, which is a um, um, antibody titer to a, a protein that is on the bacteria, if it's greater than or equal to 1 to 3,200, we recommend not vaccinating those animals because they might be more at risk of developing a, a purpura reaction. So that hyperimmune response that I talked about earlier. Um, and so, you know, you can actually run those titers before you vaccinate. Um, a lot of people, you know, don't run them and they feel comfortable um, vaccinating and they don't have any problems, but probably the horses that you should consider vaccinating consider um, testing would be a horse that has like an unknown history or if it came from, you know, a background that maybe it has a higher risk of having exposure to, to strangles. Um, uh, Cause, and, or, you know, you definitely don't want to um, do it too soon after an outbreak um, uh, um, because then maybe they'll have higher titers after that outbreak. So usually we, we say about a year after the, um, the outbreak is usually when those titers are in a safe range, but you could still test them if you feel more comfortable with that. Um, which also brings to the point where, you know, should you, should you vaccinate in the face of an outbreak and in, you know, there's been, a, um, there's definitely concerns about doing that if you don't have a horse, you don't, you have horses that you don't know whether they've been exposed or not, because you might actually end up with proper reactions in those horses. So it really depends on how well you can segregate those animals. And um, there was a, a paper that looked at, um, you know, the lessons learned from a strangles outbreak and, and it was a very large, um, 
breeding farm and, you know, the, their take home was to not vaccinate. They did vaccinate what the, the horses that they thought were not exposed. And just as you were mentioning before about how contagious it is, um, you know, there was actually, you know, six or seven horses that actually ended up with purple hemorrhagica and, and about four or five of those were actually from getting the vaccine um, because they were, um, you know, probably were exposed and they didn't realize that they were exposed. Yeah. It's sort of pretty sobering stuff really. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, and you know, the vaccine is um, certainly not a fail safe, right? There's, there's, it's, it's got its, it's, it's uh, got its issues too, that it's not perfect, yeah. but definitely helps give you some protection. And yeah. I've, I've seen it be very helpful. Um, never done it in the face of an outbreak, but farms that were vaccinated, C- certainly less of a, a an extreme disease cases. Yeah, and I think that's uh, what some people have trouble understanding is that I'm vaccinated and yet I still had the disease. But it says, well, okay, it had an outbreak, but it was nowhere near as bad as it would have been if you hadn't actually taken preventative measures to start with. COVID has actually helped explain that to people. Yeah, I think they understand just a little bit better now. Yeah, yeah. So it's a hell of a way to find out. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, okay. Um, you mentioned testing before about culture and PCR. Is there anything coming on the horizon that you know of or um, are working on that uh, may improve our ability to diagnose this faster? Because culture taking a couple of days is frustrating. PCR, if you're in a, re- a more remote location, take, could take a few days to come out. Is there anything on the horizon which may help us do it sooner? Yeah, so um, there's there is one product actually on the market that um, is a, a stall side PCR or a um, you know a um, not related to the podcast, of course. You have to have the <laughs> you, what's that? Not related to the podcast. The stall side, the stall side. Yeah, yeah. we were ahead yes, of our yes, time. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, it, it's a it's kind of a desktop PCR that you could potentially have in your clinic, um, and then we actually it's not commercially available, but we did a, a project looking at um, um, using a, te- a molecular technology called LAMP, so um, loop amplification, and um, where you it actually like magnifies the DNA um, using multiple primers and and um, it actually was you know really um, sensitive at finding the, the um, strep equi um, and it actually would be on, you know if it came to fruition and and became commercially available it would actually be on a cartridge that you would actually, read with your smartphone. Um, so, you know, there's some, there's some neat potential things out there. Um, you know, just need to get someone who wants to actually like make it a product, um, uh, because it, it, um, you know, we look, we looked at it in horses that were, um, convalescence so recovering so we were looking for carriers so we were actually looking for the hardest ones to find um and we were doing it on guttle pouch lavages um so it would actually probably have even you know it would even um you know th- those are the ones with the smallest amount of dna in them you know those samples because they are um not not you know full of pus anymore they don't have you know abscesses they're they're um almost cleaned up but they're still you know got some positive pcr or or lamp depending on which one you're using and so those are the hardest ones to detect um but we've we were able to detect them and so i i think that that actually has you know some potential for being able to do it you know stall side it was within um 10 to 30 minutes depending on um how much organism there was there um you know or at least you could bring it back to your clinic and do it there so that's the list of things your iphone can do yeah there you go put them on it's not just for kitten videos and recipes and (laughs) and, you know that sort of stuff you can actually do something useful with it well that's actually good because that's that's a major problem there's always that delay say you're thursday afternoon in a remote location the weekend comes in you can't ship anything and maybe tuesday before you find something and that's the outbreak is over or it is it's it's moved on it's so yeah so that's good to know that something like that's coming down the pike because that's that's really going to help because the world's always looking for a better mousetrap that's right Yep. And a better strangles test was number two in the survey. 
Yeah. So that's great. So um, good. No, thank you, Ashley. Any any closing words on uh, on strangles? Yeah. Well, another promising thing is that there's um, a new vaccine that's been licensed in the EU. Um, and so hopefully maybe at some point we might get that vaccine as well. That it was it's um, intramuscular, but had um, after three vaccines, it had 94 um, percent efficacy. So um so maybe that will come down the pipeline in the U S as well. Um, so we're uh, to maybe improve some of the, the protection that we're able to provide these horses. Well, 94% would be great. Yeah. That'd that would, be fantastic. Uh, that would move you way along. Make you feel a lot more comfortable. It'd be much better. Yeah. Vaccination would be a lot easier sell if it was 94% effective. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tough disease. I hate it. Yeah. But, uh, but actually well named. It's one of those things that you talked about, you know, <laughs> it had been since like 1200 or something AD it was first recommended. It was like choke, right? It's a very descriptive thing. Oh, my horse is choking. Well, yeah, it's choking and strangles. It's essentially the horse is like being strangled. So the power of observation, it's actually a very descriptive name. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, Hopefully the horses don't, you know, get that bad because that that that's when they need the tracheostomies and so forth. Yeah. Like you yeah, said. well, it's a case of employing a surgeon from time to time, isn't it? Really, give them <laughs> give them something to do. They gotta have something. To do. They gotta have something to do. Well, again, thanks for your time. Um, this has been great. Uh, we've been talking to Dr. Ashley Boyle from the University of Pennsylvania New Bolton Centre Field Service on the subject of strangles. See you next time. <laughs>